Joining us on the couch now, my name's Steve Carb, also known as a Digital Natural Mystic, many other things over the years. Uh, it's a drum based producer, been producing for labels like Moving Shadow, Metalhead, 31 Records, Renegade Hardware, pretty much every major drum bass label over, over the years. Over the years, yeah. And, um, yeah, so I mean, rather than, uh, you know, I, th I think we may as well just get into a track first of all, just so people get an initial vibe of, of what you're all about, all right. my man. Stick this on. This is Sound Killer coming on Timeless. So now it's good, it's good to have you here, must say. Now, nice to be here, mate. Ipswich, have I pronounced it right? Yeah, Ipswich. Not Ipwich. No, nah, Ipby Witch or anything like Ipby that. Ipby Witch. Born and bred, Ipswich? Yeah. Tell us about Ipswich. Whereabouts is it geographically? Uh, in? You know, uh, England, east of England, yeah. It goes like this. There's that big wash bit there, yeah. At the bottom of that hole there. <laughs> sort of like um, northeast from London. About 70 miles away, 120k or something. Cool. Yeah, it's just. It's a country place, but there's quite a few people living there. It's not a little village or nothing. A few good pubs. But yeah, a few good pubs. It's, you know, it's not some little tiny place where nothing happens. A lot of music comes out of there. There's yeah, a lot of music musically, stuff, who else yeah. has come out of there? This um, like in drum and bass scene, there's a been a few people out of there, like Fotec, um, and it's like a, you know, a Source Direct, Origination, just just loads of different people, and like reggae bands, Joe Warriors, who used to run with Adwas Aswad back in the day, like 20 years right. ago, and that. Yeah, just like there's like quite a few people from there. So you growing up, you know, originally from Ipswich. What musically, what was inspiring you? Um, <clears throat> well, my dad for a start, he's been playing reggae, soca, and all that for like 35 years, like phew, at least that. And um, so I had records around me all the time. And then there's my I've got older sisters and brothers, and they're playing I don't know soul and whatever the piss mode, anything. Like my brother with hip hop, so I'm listening to electronic music mixed with reggae. Um, and then, like I say, there's all music, loads of DJs in it, switch up ones a DJ, so, so it's like that. <clears throat> I mean, in the 80s, UK sound system culture played a big part in, uh, you know... Yeah, I mean, that's what I was doing at first, I was playing reggae, um, same as everyone else, until the, like, the rave culture came in. Um, everyone went to the raves and left the little reggae parties, so I was okay. sort of like, veered over to that. I mean, going back to the sound systems, who, who personally was your favourite sound system? Your um, favourite sound? Well, Jamaican sounds, really. My dad had a little sound still. He was doing his thing. And then um, local sounds, I was with them. But uh, just Bodyguard and Saxon, the English one, Stone Love, people like that. I mean, did you have any experience in the, you know, the, the other side of the sound system culture with actually you know, putting together sound systems? and? Yeah. When I was, a little, well, about, when I was about 18 or something, I actually bugging my finger up and got loads of money and you know I started building and messing around with speakers and frequencies and all kind of stuff so um, yeah just sort of started from there really nice. yeah now when you say you got bitten by the rave bug what what year are we talking about 1990 because I, I was playing there's, there's a guy called Danny C in the drum bass scene right um, I went to Colchester which is like 18 miles away from my house from, from Ipswich right uh, I took my dad's sound system there, I was playing reggae with my friend YT, and he came up to me and said, oh, you'll bring your speakers up to the beach, mate, you know, like, next week there's a party going on, you know, you could bring your speakers up there. So I took my speakers up there, and everyone's jumping around, raving, and I thought, oh, this is great, this is like, I listened to the music, it was mixed, you know, sort of like hip-hop, sort of with reggae, bass lines or whatever, and I liked the two music, so um, it was sort of like two musics gelling together, and I just got well hooked on it. And like Danny C started bringing his uh, decks round, so I was practicing. I started doing a few little parties, you know, sort of drum bass parties, mixing with a bit of reggae and whatever, mm -hmm. around my sort of area. I just got, got on in like that. And I started raving myself and listening to uh, the top DJs and whatever. And I don't know, about 93 or something, I thought, yeah, I could, I'm sure I could do this music. So I sort of started trying with Danny C, you know. It just sort of followed from there. And the first Rick was out on Certificate 18? Yeah, in 94, me and Danny C, yeah. I mean, in terms of, like, uh, you know, the, the, the path of history within UK breakbeat music, when the whole, what the media, well, you know, this thing, jungle blew up, yeah. it, was, it was mad, it was everywhere. Like, you know, you, you, the Face magazine, ID mm. magazine, every second compilation was Jungle Mania, but this was a pretty vibrant time, man. I mean, for yeah. you, what was this whole, when, when Jungle exploded, what was it like? What are, you, what are your fondest memories from that oh. time? Just everyone. Well, I'm from China. Right, this is 
this is kind of different, but I'm from Chantry, right? It's a bit, bit of a dodgy estate, right, in Ipswich. A bit, little bit racist, all right? So, you know, I'm going to these parties and I'm seeing these racist people talk to black people and these black people talk to these racist people. And it's like bringing everyone together. You know, was, that's amazing, really. Do you know what I mean? And that was free music, you know? So that was one of the most amazing things about, uh, about the, um, the jungle culture, whatever, the, the, this new party thing going on. Would you it's say bringing everyone together. Prior, prior to that whole thing, you know, there was still, there was a bit of segregation going on within camps. With, what, well, music-wise, you mean? Yeah, well, just, just in general with, with different races, but this thing kind of brought all these races together kind of thing. Yeah, it did. Uh, it, you know, you've got people, like I say, these sort of people who don't like reggae and whatever, it's all jumping around to this sort of reggae-influenced music and whatever. And that, that was just amazing in itself. And, and, the, and all the reggae boys as well, to be honest, they was like, oh, I ain't going to them jungle raves, sod them, and they'd turn up, do you know what I mean? And it was really good. For you, I mean, at what, at what point, you know, with the production thing, <clears throat> did you sit there and go, right, you know, I, I think I, you know, sure you released, you did your first track, but at what point did you go, right, you know, this is serious, man? Um, well, in 94, I'd done the track with Danny C, but in 95, I'd done a track on t my first solo release on Timeless called Space Funk, mm. and that was my first track. And, um, well, people were just going mental about it, and it got played for about four years or something. I don't know, and, uh, over the first sort of two years, I thought, hold on a minute, you know, I can actually, you know, I've done that with my eyes shut sort of thing. So <laughs> I thought, all right, I must be able to, you know, carry on, make a sort of make it worthwhile for me, make a job out of it, a career out of it, do you know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> all musical genres, you know, especially new musical genres, have their epicentre, be it, you know, your Paradise Garage or your Warehouse <laughs> or Broken Beat Now has got co-op. And, you know, throughout the, this course of history, there was, like, Rage at Heaven for the Breakbeat Hardcore, you mm. know, th a night like AWOL for Jungle. But mm. around 96, well, even 95, it was all about Blue Note. And yeah. no matter where you were in the world, no matter what musical genre, be, be you into Detroit techno or what, everyone knew about Blue, Blue Note, man. Yeah. Tell us about Blue Note because... Do you know what? I, I think it's just, um, okay, everyone, everyone's happy about going to like, a big rave and whatever, that's cool. But this Blue Note was a nice, small club, but, and this is fat the, sound This system. is Metalheads. Yeah, this is the Metalheads thing I'm talking about. Um, they took um, a sound system called Eskimo Noise in there. It used to absolutely smash the club up. And the vibe in there was amazing. And I think, you know, there's queues outside, 100 people outside queuing all night. And that was a vibe, you know. I mean, as a, you know, everyone wanted to play there because it is so fabulous, and and you know, I think that was a big major factor in the, in the vibe of the scene, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, you know, this whole uh, something that was definitely ingrained with the Blue Note thing. I mean, dub plate culture has always existed from right back, you know, and even in you know Jamaican sounds some days having yeah. VIPs, having dubs, fresh, fresh, fresh. But yeah. Blue Note kind of personified. The whole, that's where you'd go to hear Groove Rider play the freshest, latest. Yeah, definitely. And everyone, everyone went there. If they, if they was playing at Blue Note, it was like, you know, if someone was playing at Blue Note, there'd be no doubt they'd be phoning you up the day before. If you've got any tunes, you know, everyone wanted to be, you know, everyone wanted to represent there. That was the place, definitely. And you always had to come with fresh stuff or else? Yeah, well, well to be, but then again, that was just a vibe in there, do you know what I mean? I don't think, um, I think everyone wanted to play fresh in there, but it was just a vibe, it was just amazing. Small club and a massive sound system. How did your link up with Middleheads come about? Because obviously you released uh, a track um, called Down Under in Niagara. Well, uh, I'd done a track called Touch Me in 95, 96 on Timeless. Um, that was getting played, that was doing well. And Goldie was breakdancing to it. And you remember Speed? That was uh, Fabio and Bookham's club, right? And he was breakdancing to it in Speed one time and someone said, yeah, it's his track. And he came over to me and said, oh, you know, sort me out, sort me out, sort of thing. And, you know, I'd done, I'd done a couple of tracks and sent them down to him and he was just like, yeah, they're, you know, great stuff. And that's quite easy, I think. If you're making, the, you're making tracks that people want to sign or people enjoy when they're playing that and whatever, it's quite easy to get, to get through <coughs> in that way. I mean, back then, production-wise, you know, you, you were always doing something different. It was always like, you know, very bass heavy and more of a vibe. I mean, what were you trying to do back then to kind of, you know, stay something different from the rest of what was coming um, out at that time? I don't think I was trying to be anyone else. Right? I think I was drawing from my influences from when I was younger. Like, for example, the, the first track I'd done was a bit, bit reggae, a bit, bit electronic, a bit, there's a string in it, a bit poppy, a bit Depeche Mode, you know what I mean? And I was just, and a bit hip-hoppy as well, the breaks, you know, I was just drawing from my influences and I think, 
that's really important because like, I think sometimes even now, nowadays, like new artists will just sort of copy what's going on in the scene, mm. and you don't, you know, they sort of they become throwaway tracks. You know what I mean? If you put a little, because everyone's an individual, you see, you know, and um, if everyone draws from their influences, everyone's influences are different. Do you know what I mean? You end up making different tracks, and that's what I, that's what I was doing. You know, I didn't think, right, okay, I need to do this sort of track, or I need to do that sort of track. I just, you know, it was from here. You know. Mm. I mean, in terms of, uh, you talk about the label Timeless, uh, a man named Brillo used to run it. Tell us about, you know, your, your relationship with him, because obviously you've grown with Timeless as a label. Yeah, well, um, like I say, the first two tracks done, what, what I'd done solo, done really well for me, and they were on Timeless, which was his label at the time. So, you know, he was sort of like asking, because I was doing well, I suppose, he was asking me for a lot of advice as well, on tracks to take, on tracks to sign and stuff. So, um, got a relationship like that, and further on in the years, um, he was helping me out by, you know, like by promoting me. I mean, all I had to do is make music, and he was promoting me with the uh, label and stuff. Do you know what I mean? So we sort of teamed up because we can work for each other, you know. Now, I mean, should we listen to another to check something on? Yeah. Now? Is there anything in particular? Cool. Um, I'll put on Deadline. I think. Cool. It's a bit mad, isn't it? I mean, tell us about this track. This, this kind of, I mean, there was a period for you where, I mean, you're still making bits, but it wasn't prevalent. Then all of a sudden, it was just like, I think it was about three or four years ago, where it was just like, all this attention, like, the track like Deadline was just being caned all across the, broad, the, the board. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think, again, it was just me doing my own thing. There was nothing like that at the time. Everyone was, um, I think, like, the, the, the leaders at the time, kind of innovators, whatever, was Ed Rush and Ops Cool. And it was very, sort of, I don't know, techno or whatever. Mm. And originally, I think drum and bass is a bit, a bit reggae influenced and a lot of soul and whatever. Do you know what I mean? Yes. And quite happy music. And you know, girls were leaving the club. There weren't the girls in the clubs. You know what I mean? It was just a bit. wasn't very. wasn't. It's a bit grim in there. A lot of men going to the club, and you know, and this sort of like put some fun back into the scene. So like everyone played it, and it went done really well for me. Yeah. Is that the right one? I mean, so that, that there ended up being huge, like, at, all across the world, it was, yeah. like, one of the biggest dancehall tunes, six rewinds, kind of, every time it got played, kind of business. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, the drum and bass scene's always been really cyclic, it, you know, say in the mid-90s with the, uh, the whole Bookham thing, yeah. good looking, that whole sound was, was running, and then all of a sudden, next thing you know, that was out, came to a coffee table, everyone said, and then it was all about tech step, and yeah. then, I don't know, I mean... It, when you say before, like, you know, there was a period of time when, like, the, it was, the scene was very, very techno-y, and yeah. that was kind of like, were you kind of, you know, you weren't feeling the scene so much during that period? Yeah, because I think a few tracks before that, me and our spirit guys working with at the time, we was both thinking, uh, what the hell's going on here, mate? We was like, you know, let's get a job, shall we? Or something like that, you know? And, um, For real, really? Yeah, I was like, you know, I'm not, I'm not into all this. You know, I'm a reggae man. Do you know what I mean? I, you know, I like a bit of soul, a bit of jazz or something. I like a bit of soul in my music. Do you know what I mean? And that was just, wow, wow, just all this noise going on, right? And it just weren't happening for me. Um, and to be honest, we've done a track called Phantom Force, which was before that, and that sort of swept all that crap away, sort of thing. I mean, crap, at the same time, it wasn't just yourself, there were a lot of other producers as well, and one that notably comes to mind is Fotec, who, yeah. you know, during that whole period, Fotec was the man, you yeah. know, beat programming whiz, and... Yeah, big time. Then it's just like, all of a sudden, someone who's so prevalent in the scene just went, right, I'm not feeling it. Yeah. Because, um, he's the same again, he's a, he likes soul in his music, do you know what I mean? And that was, you know, you're playing to, you're playing to like 35 men in a club, do you know what I mean? <laughs> and that's just not happening, is it? Do you know what I mean? It's, it's, do you know what I'm saying? It's not what you signed no, up for. It's not fun, is it, mate? I mean, for you, for you, when you when you stepped in the studio with Deadline, what was kind of going through your head? What were you? Um, first of all, I thought I got the drums and I said, oh, yeah, these are interesting, a bit African sound and whatever. And I thought, yeah, I'm just going to try and make some kind of like happy thing that people can jump around and enjoy themselves to. Do you know what I mean? Instead of just nodding their head and looking all upset about something. Do you know what I mean? Do you know? Now, so. you, prior to Timeless, you, throughout the 90s, you, you never had your own label, you're never running another label. But uh, part of Timeless came a label called Function, mm -hmm. which was kind of, you know, it was a project as well that you were overseeing. Yeah. Tell, I mean, tell us about what 
you wanted to achieve with the label? On that label there, I just wanted to show that I can do, you know, you can do your own thing and get away with it, basically, at the time, you know, because everyone was copying everyone. That's the same again, I, I'll, probably say, I'll probably said this already, but that label was for me to just, um, just to float around on, not, not watch the whole scene and say, OK, I need to do this, I need to do that. It was just for me to just put a few things on. There was a big tracks on there, there was tiny tracks on there. I didn't care, do you know what I mean? It was just music on there, you know? Simple as that. Nice. I mean, and who are we talking? Just like close, just close friends, just yourself, or there's like seventy-five percent me and close friends, you know, who who enjoyed um, expressing themselves without looking over their shoulder and watching everyone else do their tracks and copying them. Do you know what I'm saying? I mean, and also another thing as well is, um, <clears throat> you know, for a lot of people making drum and bass outside of England, it always seemed it was like a very much a UK thing. It was all always. UK and then the rest of the world, mm. but uh, you know, as well as people like Marky and XRS <coughs> yeah. coming from Brazil, you know, Timeless was one of the only labels that was actually keeping an eye out for what was going on outside. Tell I me, mean, tell us about that. Yes, yeah, it's the same, same again, really. Um, people, uh, there's established artists out there, right? And people kind of play safe, I think, with that. Um, we enjoy all, all kind of music, no matter who does it and what kind of style it is. We like jazzy, you know, time has released jazzy stuff, ragga stuff, techie stuff, everything. And that's kind of what we like to play as well. And um, so no matter who you are, where you're from, you know, like Conk or Dawn, for example, do you know what I mean? Uh, that was a techie track. They were new artists, haven't had a release in the UK before. And we took that track on and it sold, I think today, it sold about 11,000 or something. And, and for that, I mean, uh, you know, Conk or Dawn are, uh you know, again, it's the New Zealand. I feel like I'm flying the New Zealand flag, yeah. but there's a couple of guys from New Zealand, and you'd been DJing out there a bit. Yeah. You got to know them, hung out with them. Yeah. They came around to you. You know, you chilled with them. They gave yeah. you a demo, and you kind of went out of your way to listen mm. to it, and then. Yeah, because uh, that's another thing. Um, the timeless music group I'm involved with. We do like a label called L Plates, right, for new artists or whatever, right? There's a Learner lot of people, plates. L Plates, isn't yeah. It? Like a, yeah, Learner Plates. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of um, artists who are going on to do a load of big things now have come through that label, right? Mm. And basically, um, I thought, yeah, that tune's really good, you know, I'm going to put it on there. And, um, you know, this same track was being played by, like, big DJs for about three months. No one snapped it up because they were new artists from New Zealand, right? And I thought, you know, that's a bit silly, you know, so I took it home and um, I was talking to my partner, Brillo, and we said, oh, let's just put it on, the, on, the, on Timeless, you know, this track's really good. And um, that's what happened. The next minute, everyone, I mean everyone in the scene, are phoning up Concord, Dawn, oh, give us a track, give us a track, you know? And that's just the scene for you, you know? People are scared and people don't like to do new things, you know? We like to do Why new is things. that, man? Um, I really don't know because me and Bill are relaxed people, you know? And we're quite, quite open and that. I, I don't know, I think people are just. I couldn't tell you. No, I can't tell you. I don't know why, you know. I mean, I really you, don't know why. To, just, just for an idea, I mean, how many... You guys are obviously always checking out for new demos. Yeah? Yeah. No matter where you tour around the world, you're always checking demos. That's the other thing. I listen to everything. If, you, if, if someone gives me, like, a, the only thing what does piss, jar me off or whatever, right, <laughs> is if someone keeps sending me 13 tracks, 13 tracks on one CD, because I can get 10 tracks, I've listen to 130 tracks in a week, and I've got a life, do you know what I mean? So I, I say to people, if you're going to stay in touch with me, send me like a few tracks and whatever, and I'll check every track, do you know what I mean? So the best... And I don't think people actually do. I do. The best way for like, you know, for people in this room, for example, if they've got a demo to see, your advice is, you know, stick maybe two or three good tracks. Yeah. Rather than a whole 13. Yeah, a whole lot, yeah. Because it's only going to annoy me, do you know what I mean? Because I have got a life and there's nothing against people, but, you know, if you keep in touch with me, send me... If you... If you release a lot of tracks all the time. If you, sorry, if you like produce a lot of tracks all the time, you know, just keep sending me every week or every two weeks or whatever, and I'll check them out, and I'll be happy to check out two or three, and it's great. But it does really get a lot when you've got 10 tracks, 10 CDs, 10 tracks on each one, 100 tracks I've got to listen to. I've got friends, I've got my own work to do. Do you know what I'm saying? I mean, going, going back to that whole thing of, you know, drum and bass being a genre of music that was very much a UK thing, and now, you know, it's blowing up around the world. Yeah, are you constantly finding new pockets of, like, you know, say, for example, Eastern Europe, there seems to be this whole vibe going on there now, or...? Yeah, I mean, uh, people just... People, like, hear about how we are, you know, at Timeless and whatever, 
and there's always people sending us stuff. I mean, like, not all of it's great and whatever, but it's really interesting to listen to, and people are, people around the world are really, I think um, technology is helping them to produce better stuff, do you know what I mean? And, um, yeah, that's really, that's really exciting, do you know what I mean? Because um, you never know what's going to happen next, do you know what I mean? What you're going to get sent next. That's why I check everything. Nice. Yeah. I mean, the other thing that, uh, you know, Timeless has kind of expanded into is this, uh, the distribution thing. Mm -hmm. Now, in the last two or three years, not, not just with drum and bass, but all electronic music on a whole, we've had all these distributors just go out. EFA, big German distributor, mm. gone, uh, yeah. Prime, techno distributor. And in drum and bass especially was the major one, vinyl distribution. Yeah. And a lot of people complain that this whole thing about, oh, tune, you know, DJs keep holding on to dub plates because they want fresh tunes. Mm. What they don't realise is that, you know, it's actually, if there's problems with the distribution, you're not getting yeah. tunes. Yeah, it's hard out there. I mean... I think people get uh, distributions um, sort of. <laughs> some of them are greedy, I think, and they try their luck with a lot of stuff where they shouldn't try their luck with. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? They get themselves into trouble, and then it reflects onto the labels, and then the next minute the labels can't release anything, and it just all gets into one big mess. They owe money and they can't pay the artist advances and stuff. The next minute tr tracks are piling up, tracks are unreleased at the distribution, it just gets out of hand. I mean, and with Final Distribution, for example, it got very out of hand. Yeah, like, really out of hand, you know, there's big, big money being owed at the time. And it got messy. 100,000 quid, certainly, you know, yeah. can put a bit of dent uh, in you. Yeah. Now, I mean, what was, because obviously there's Load, what, if you, what was your whole aim with Load? And what well, is Load, first of all? Well, it's a, it's, a, it's a small distribution company, right? And because... Um, like Brillo and myself were looking after, um, I don't know, eight, nine, ten people's labels. We decided to, you know, make a, make a go, proper go of it, you know. But it's not like 50 labels and ten of them are good and the other 40 are rubbish. It's just like, you know, there's only a few labels there. And it's just a nice little tight controlled thing where we can, so we can oversee everything really, do you know what I mean? It's a, it's a nice little tight thing. We're not, we're not going to be like taking everyone's label and all that sort of thing, you know. But we're talking, you know, it's very much international. You've got labels from yeah. where? Yeah, it's from New Zealand, America, just UK. It's, it's, it's all over the place, everywhere. I mean, what are you guys looking for in a label that you um, know, will warrant wanting to work with them? Not one hit wonders and stuff like that. Um, just consistency and stuff. And if you're a new label, just want to, you know, just want to see that you're trying your own thing, you know. Some people send tracks that sounds like everyone else, and that doesn't work with us because we don't know how long that's going to last. Do you know what I mean? I mean, also, you know, obviously the game's changed a lot in the last, you know, three or four years with, with you know, today's current climate, blah, 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 blah. Are you guys making sure, you know, with, with certain labels, you, you are pressing, like, minimal amounts? Cause a lot of distributions, you know, their downfall is the fact that they will quite that's, happily... Yeah, that's the other thing. We're doing a tight ship, like I say, again... You know, because um, if you overpress, you, you know, everyone's losing money and it's not good for anything and you've got records sitting there that just get burnt and everything. And that's been the problem with um, vinyl and SRD and a few and Alpha Magic, they're overpressing and there's uh, records not being sold. So, you know, everyone's losing money, even themselves. Um, because in general, the label's not going to say, OK, I owe you £500 and give them the money. It's just not happening. So everyone starts losing out and it affects everything. So that's why, that's why a lot of distributions are going down at the moment. I mean, I know, I know it's a, t a tired old argument, but uh, I think with drum bass more than any other genre, the whole MP3 downloading thing, I mean, how much really is this soul seek Kazar business affecting things? I think a lot because... A lot, I mean, a lot of drum and bass is DJ music, right? And if the DJ can get that off the net, well, it's going to affect the sales. You know, definitely. So, you know, and they're outselling uh, Technic decks at the moment, so it just says everything. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and even to the point where, you know, with, with this whole fever and nature of wanting to get fresh tunes, you know, tunes that you've, say, for example, you've, you've played it somewhere, you've let, given it out to a few people, you know, a very tight ship, and the next thing you know, two weeks later, it's on the yeah. internet, tunes that haven't even been released. Yeah, that's the other thing. You have to be really... T I mean, at the moment, the, the way we are, pro you know, our production line or whatever has changed. Now, if we give a track out, it's, you know, it's really tight. People have known for years, you know, it's no one going to slag it over the internet. So, and more than that, I'll get it, decide where it's going, decide on what label it's going on and whatever, and then I'll get it mastered straight away. As before, I'd let it, 
you know, ferment a bit along, uh, around the scene or you know, let the DJs play it first. But now I'd rather get it straight out of the vinyl and get it out. Mm. You know, it's, it's all different now. I mean, what do, I, mean, I mean, it's a bit of a shame, though, that you have to kind of, like, you yeah. have to think before you go to someone, someone's like, hey, man, I love that tune, yeah. can, I, can I have a don't copy? Don't give it out, don't give it out, and that's, that's not the vibe, is it? It's not nice. You don't want to sound like Colonel, yeah. you know? Yeah, it's not nice. I mean, with, with the whole dub plate thing, I mean, obviously, you know, with, with a lot of UK-based genres, especially, like, with, with the garage thing, but always drum, bass, and jungle, it was, it was plates, man, it was, everyone was playing plates. Mm -hmm. How much has that game changed now? CDs again, it's cheaper to buy a CD and put 10 tracks on there instead of buying five dub plates. You know, it's like 150 quid or, I don't know, 30 pence, you know. But again, this, you know, if you're, if you're promoting playing CDs, you know, if you're for big, massive DJs playing a CD in a club and everyone's looking at him playing a CD, yeah, they probably think, oh, you know, I don't need to buy a record, I'll play CDs as well. And, does that, I mean, does that scare you as a label owner? It's like you're kind of advocating the use of this, or...? Well, it's just, just how it's got, you know, it's just... You can't, you can't fight against it. I mean, I play CDs, vinyl and dub plates, it just depends how well, how well the, the track actually sounds. If I need to go and get it mastered on a dub plate, I'll do it. I mean, there's this, uh, you know, there's a bit of a legendary place, and I'm sure it still is, uh, but especially in the, in the mid to late 90s, there's a place called Music House. Yeah. First of all, you know, for people that don't know, tell us about Music House. Yeah, I mean... It's a shame about Music House, like everyone used to go there, cut dub plates, and everyone used to, you know, meet there, how's it going, hi, how are you, you know, and everyone w w was friends and all that sort of stuff. Now, <laughs> you'll get, you won't even get a phone call, you don't talk to no one from one year to the next, it's like, someone will get on the Insta AOL Instant Messenger, hello, have you got any tunes, mate? Yeah, download it, see ya, thanks. You know, and that's, that's, not, that's not a good vibe for anything, is it, you know? It's like we all turn into computer nerds or something. <laughs> I so, mean, I don't like that. It used to be a meeting place, everyone used to meet each other. There's people releasing tracks on their, own, on their label and they haven't even met the artist. Do you know what I mean? I, don't, I, don't, I still don't do that. I, I go to meet the people. I, I, went, I, was on, I was in Hungary on the weekend, do you know what I mean, to go and meet some people, you know? I, it's just us rude, do you know what I mean? You know, people will hit me up and say, oh, <laughs> They don't know me from Adam, you know, and they're like, oh, have you got any tracks, mate? And I'm like, who the hell are you, you know? Piss off, sort of thing. <laughs> I mean, is it, is, is it really sad that that whole, you know, music house meet and greet, checking out new tunes that way, mm. has just, has, that element's just completely yeah, gone? Yeah, it's sad. I think it is. It's, like I say, it's, meet, it's meeting people and being, you know, looking at people eye to eye, you know, and stuff like that. It's just normal courtesy for human beings, you know. It's like, like I say, we turn to computer nerds or something. I mean, the other thing with, with the, the whole AOL and the messenger thing is, you know, tunes aren't getting properly mastered, yeah. someone's just like finishing a rough version, sending it to their mate, say, oh, don't play it out, but, you know, see what you think, and they're just, oh, I'll play it out anyway. And yeah. next thing you know, you've got some really crap music. Some crusty complete. music coming for the speakers, yeah. And that's, uh, that's another thing. It's nice to master your things and have it presented nice when you play it out. But it's not happening. Should we just listen to another track? Anything particular yeah. you'd like to... Uh, I'll put a, put a gate man thing on there. Yeah? Oh. So that, that track was called Gate Man. And what, what was what was going on in the studio with that one? Well, I mean, all them effects and whatever, sort sort of live me playing around. Um, just wanted to do my own little dub type thing, you know, it's like a bass frequency thing, you know. So when I play it out, it's just top, you know, bass heavy, do you know what I mean? It's just a bass heavy piece of dub kind of thing, you know, in my own, in my own way, you know. For, I mean, the main thing is like, in terms of your studio, what do you got and how, uh, how much has your, your um, setup changed over the years? Uh, not, not a lot, but I mean, I've got like the like new Mac and all that crap, you know, but the, ba the basic setup is, um, the main feature is my um, Tannoy speakers, you know. I think they help me get my um, frequencies right and whatever. Because I don't like my stuff too sharp. I like it, like it kind of smooth, you know. Like reggae, you know. Like old reggae. And um, that's a good example of it, I think, you know. Mm. But yeah, the, ta the Tannoys, and I've got like Emu and Outboard Desk, like Mackie Desk and whatever. But uh, the main thing is my Tannoys. I wouldn't be able to mix how I wanted to mix if I didn't have those. 
I mean, also, in terms of like base, how important is <clears throat> we're talking to uh, Mo before about you know getting lac master lacquers done. I mean, how important is you know for for the cut for you? Mastering that, mm. yes, yeah, it's, it's very important because um, I'm not a master. I just make tunes really, and I try and mix it down as best I can. And then I want it to. Um, you just want all them frequencies to be all smooth and whatever, you know. So. Uh, I can only do so much, really, at my home studio. You know, guys train for years to to be master and engineers. You know, and, you know, leave, try to try to uh, leave it in their capable hands. You know, so and you get what you pay for as well. I mean, if you if you ever look inside the you know the, the middle edging, and it's not just a drum and bass; it's a lot of records. You'll see like Simon at the Exchange, yeah. or Stuart Metropolis. Tell us yeah. about these guys and, and what role do they play in the scene? Oh, they play a big role. You've got um, Simon Exchange. He sort of I think he does the sort of harder stuff, you know, he, he gives a sort of loud cut, you know, and things are quite distorting, you know, if you put a track of his on, it's, it's going to be loud. And Stuart, I prefer Stuart at Metropolis because um, he'll smooth and everything, he's more, he's more expensive, he doesn't distort everything and turn everything up and do this and do that. He'll take the horrible frequencies out and just, just re relax the track a bit more, you know, and, it's, and, the, and he keeps the bass there as well. I mean, what are we looking at price-wise for that for that kind of lack of service? Uh, Metropolis is about to cut and everything things like about three hundred, and uh, Simon Exchange is about one eighty or something. But definitely worth it, yeah. Yeah, definitely worth it. It's got to be done. I mean, production-wise, obviously, for you know, bass plays a big important part for you. Apart from the you know the speakers, mm. I mean, how much time do you spend on a, on a, on a bass line and? Um, to be honest, I'll probably do about, unless I'm lucky, I'll probably do about 20 bass lines and chuck 19 away in the end. Because I want, I want to get a good one going, you know. It's never, it's never really the first one. I don't think I've ever done a track. I think that one took me ages. Yeah. I mean, how does the production process work for you? I mean, do you start with, say, a sample or you muck around with a bass line or...? It's never the same. That's why my tracks kind of vary as well. Um, the, the thing I, I like most about making it is I, I like the drums, I like drums, I like bass and I like samples, I like everything so, you know, it's never, it's never the same. I couldn't say, I haven't got a formula. You, you listen to some artists, you know they've got a formula, yeah. you know they have, but I haven't. I, I, can, I can work with musicians, I, I'll um, work, start off with a crusty old bongo or something or whatever, just, just just whatever, whatever takes my fancy at the time. I mean, as well as drum and bass, there's, I mean, there have been lots of stories for a while about a, a reggae project. Tell us about that. Me? Um, well, it's a friend I've known for like, 18 years. It's a white guy, he's a reggae dancehall artist. Um, I haven't actually done much towards the project yet, but, you know, it's nearing the end of it. So I'm in the middle of doing a couple of tracks now. And that's a dancehall. Um, to be honest, I like dancehall, but I like the older reggae, to be honest. I like, um, I don't know, I listen to Dennis Brown or Tennis or Sugar Miner, that sort of stuff. That's what I'm into. That's why I like my bass, because they often use uh, rhythms with fat bass in it, you know? Cool. Yeah. I mean, and what else is coming up for you? What are you working on at the moment? Um, well, Timeless, since I've joined Timeless, it's sort of been like 10 years. So we're doing like a 10 year Timeless album next year. Um, that's with various artists who have been on Timeless over the years as well. There's a project there and me personally, I'm just going to be like, I'm just in the studio. Cause I haven't been in the studio much because I've been involved in distribution and other rubbish. So I want to do back, I wanna, you know, going back to what I actually do is, and that's make music in the studio. So I'm just looking, apart from the album, I'm just looking to be in the studio to make make tracks, I don't care what happens with them, I just need to be making tracks. I mean, is, that, is that a bit of a drag sometimes with, you know, you, you have a really hectic DJ schedule and it's just, it's drawing you away from being in the studio? Yeah, I mean, sometimes it's hectic, sometimes it ain't, so, and I like it like that. Um, so I, I like when, if I've got DJing, I'm happy, I enjoy, I enjoy DJing, I can go and do that, but if I haven't got DJing, I'll just, you know, go through and make loads of tracks, so I'm happy either way. You're not like you know? the software on the laptop. I've got a laptop, but I, I do I do use the laptop, but I don't know. I've got a life to live as well. You know, I'm trying to calm down yeah, on the laptop one. You know, sit with me, sit with my girlfriend on the laptop. You know, yeah. 
I mean, in terms of samples as well, obviously, you know, the, you know, a lot of your tunes have got like an old reggae sample or something. Yeah. Well, what's the fine line between clearing the samples and what's the, the area with samples? Um, I, won't, I won't use a new one. It's going to be like 25 years old or something. And, or I won't use a lot of it. I'll use little snippets. Um, I, don't, I, I don't really rinse it that much. I mean, you probably can tell where they come from. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So that's, that's out of respect, really. I mean, what, what are the laws of sampling like? There's something about 25 I think, I think years after like, they die, yeah, or yeah, I think after 25 years or something like that, you can you can use it and get away with it. But I think there's amount the amount of sec there's, there's amount of seconds. I think yeah, I think it's probably like four or five seconds. I'm not sure. You can get away with it. Yeah. For you, I mean, in terms of breaks, what what are some of your favourite breaks? Um, what, amen. what what breaks should people be checking? And and who are these well, originals by? The obvious one. I mean, the, the Amen thing. There's a Paris one. Um, I'm trying to think of an example to track it, Tom. Well, I can't, but it's Amen Paris, Apache, the uh, Bongo Brothers one. You know, they're, they're the kind of regular ones, but they're the. What's the Phantom hard. Break? The Phantom Break? Yeah. What do you mean on Phantom Force? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's new, pneumatic break. I feel. To, to be honest, I'm, I'm new school. I'm not old jazz man. Do you know what I mean? I'll go off like um, tracks that I grew up with. You know, there was. Um, Back in like '91, there's something I reinforced by a pneumatic, and I use that break, so I call it the, the pneumatic break, sort of thing. But I do know some of the old ones, and I do have some of the old ones originals. But I'm not really clued up on that. Do you want to play another tune? Uh, yeah. Something. Yeah, something a little bit different. Yeah. Are there any questions at this point? What's the Paris break. The Paris break. So I'll play it to you. <laughs> I'm not, let me see if I can find it after this. Be something that Goldie, do you know Inner City Life? Of course. Yeah, you know the um, the metallic break in that? That's the Paris break. Okay. Yeah. Why do you call it the Paris Um, It's something to do with the artist. It's the artist, I think, who originally done it. Like old jazz people, yeah? Okay. So I'm saying I'm not really clued up on the old original breaks. Only some of them, do you know what I mean? Like I've got the Bongo Brothers Apache thing and the Amen Brothers Amen, you know? Yeah. And a few others. How much time you spend on... They're my favourite ones. How much time you spend on, on a break cutting it up? Um, it's not not long. It's it's just a it's just a start point type thing, and then it's like uh, just get mixing it right really when the whole track's done really. Do you know what I mean? But um, I can take for a whole track sort of um, I can take from like three days to like two weeks. It just depends, you know. Depends on what kind of track. Let me see. It's just something I've done with a. Uh, a friend plays guitar and whatever and so this track's else. called Just dig it dig it and it's coming out so you, you still like keeping the dub plate Sorry? scene alive you still like keeping the dub yeah, plate scene alive yeah cut a few you know what i mean what will dictate yeah. whether or not you're going to cut something um if it's mine yeah no not really <laughs> no um just depends if it's going to be around for a long time without being released yeah i'll cut it on a dub plate cool or if it's on one of my labels or something like that you know? No, I mean, there's, there's been another thing, you know, in terms of like talking about drum edits and, and programming of drums. There's been like this um, bit, of a, bit of a revival or, or what have you. A lot of people are harboring it as a, as a new subgenre. What they're calling break it, uh, uh, choppage, or, oh, right. or what have you. Where, you know, what, what's your whole take on, on this scene? What is it, first of all? It's just this, it's been around for ages, and I think, I don't know, just not much, not much take on it, really. It's just the same thing what's been going on for ages, really. Um, but there's a group of people sort of huddling together and making a big thing out of it, I think. Yeah. yeah. Whereas essentially it's the same as what was happening Yeah, it's been eight, happening for ages, years ago. yeah. yeah. To, and to be honest, I've, you know, I've done a few of them. You know, some of my first tracks sound like that. Yeah. So it's nothing new. I, I do like some of it. I'm not slagging on nothing, but it's nothing new. Uh, one thing's for sure, like... There's a lot of labels now with drum and bass. Whereas you go like seven, eight years ago, and there were just, you know, there were like nine or ten releases each week, yeah. and there was some quality stuff. And then over the last three or four years, you've just seen all these labels crop up. Mm. And I mean, what, what is your advice for people out there thinking about starting up a new label? <sighs> Release some stuff on some other labels first, you know, and get your name around a bit, I suppose. Unless you're doing something totally original. I mean, like, 
it's just a bit weird when people are sort of copying tracks and just not really standing out or nothing like that, and they're starting their own label. But enough respect if you're trying to do your own thing and you're going to start your own label and you want to try and be, you want to try and innovate and do something special, you know, it's, it's great, big up, but just, it's just quite, it's just quite weird when people just sound like someone else and they're going to start their own label and not going to do very well, do you know what I mean? You, see, you hear a lot of that going around at the moment? Yeah, and I get a lot of stuff sent as well, oh, can we start a label at load please, hear the tracks, and um, you just, I just think, well, you know, stick some of your influences in there, mate, you know, try and make it, make your label personal, you know, and individual and whatever, you know. Instead of trying to copy everyone else, because there's, the, uh, there's another label out there already who's doing better than you and they've been around for ages, do you know what I mean? But, you know, if you're going to come with something special and new, it's great, you know. Any other questions? Back it. Could you tell us something about MCs on the drum and bass scene? MCs? How important are they? Yeah, I, f I think they're important. Um, for the vibe and whatever, they do, they, do, um, they do excite the crowd and whatever, you know. But um, they're not always important, but I do, um, I am for them, I'm not against them at all. And, um, yeah, you, it, like, you like mixing with uh, MC Sorry? on the back? You like mixing with like MC, mixing. MC well, on the Well, a good MC is not going to shout all over my mix anyway. So, yeah, I like good MCs. Oh, I like good MCs. For example? Definitely. I think they're good for the scene. For example? Um, Rage. don't know. That's it. No, Rage. Um, <laughs> uh, Fats. There's, there's Sterling, new ones, you know. Um, there's, there's a few I can think of. I'm involved in a, some guys in New Zealand, you know, again. Salmonella Dub. They're like, you know more about me, don't you? They're, they're massive over there, aren't they? We're, um, I'm involved in that. Me and the guy who helped do that jazz track there. Um, Inner Heart, his name is. And a guy called YT, a reggae dancehall artist. And my friend NJC from Ipswich. We all like, um, we all do like a, a thing called S Sativa Records. And that is like drum and bass, reggae, anything like hip hop. That's all different stuff. I'm, I'm now involved, I've been involved for about a year. We're now doing stuff. And we're doing remix for, for Salmon and Dub and like, you know, people in England or whatever. We, we, we're trying now to do stuff, you know. So I'm well, in, I'm well involved in other music, yeah. because I, I, I think that... Mm, I've even done a remix of one no, of yours. I, I, <laughs> I know that. My, um, I'm, I'm telling you this because um, I think that mm, uh, often happen that uh, work on one's mm, main scene, like for you drum and bass, is a limit if you are a musician. Yeah. You are considered to just a drum and bass producer, mm. but basically, for me, you got the attitude to work with many, many other kind of music. Yeah, so. I think over the years I've learned as a producer, right, so, so I'm a producer, right, so not necessarily just a drum and bass producer, I think I'm a producer, and I can, you know, like, a, for example, the, the Sound With Dub remix, it's like a 125 BPM thing, sort of dub influenced thing, right, and it's me who kind of produced that track there, and, uh, but it's not drum bass, and but I've you know I've got all the I've got the musicians together, the parts and bits and bobs, and produced it kind of thing, you know, and mixed it and whatever. I, mean, what's, so what's I your, enjoy that. What's your whole vibe with working with musicians? Obviously, you know, is it well, there's a your friend of all yours playing guitar on that? Is that a direction you want to go more? I just want to do like like you say. I want to, I want to do everything really. I, I enjoy what well, I enjoy working with people for a start, and. He's a better musician than me. I'm not a musician, you know what I mean? And I'm amazed at what musicians can do. I like music. And, you know, I'm privileged to be able to produce some people who actually know music. Do you know what I'm saying? It's, it's, do you understand what I'm saying? I mean, yeah, I'm not a musician, but I'm producing musicians. You know what I'm saying? And that's, I'm privileged to do that, you know? Um, when you produce your tracks, do you always think like, I should have make the people dance, or like, this can be something that people can only listen, you know? or like you think like drum and bass is a high tempo music and people should dance to that, so I should do something that should dance. I think as the track's progressing, I'm kind of, I kind of start thinking that way, I'm kind of thinking, oh, this is a bit too, 
this is a bit listenable, you know, something to listen to, or, cool, this, this is a bit ravey, this will go off. Do you know what I mean? I don't sort of set out thinking, right, I need to do something that people are going to go mental to in the club. You know, I think as I'm getting my parts together, because I don't, I don't, you know, I, I sample records and whatever, and I sample little bits and bobs and play around with noises and process stuff and whatever. So as the track's going along, I realise what's what the track's going to be like in the end. So you know what I mean. I, so I don't set out to do a certain type of track, and that's probably why, except for that, that track, similar track there, got a musician around. So you know, it's probably going to be a bit in that way, obviously. Yeah. So I don't. Um, on the subject of the bass line, uh, it's a bit of an old argument but a, or a question, but I'd like to hear your take on it, the analog versus digital thing. Um, obviously nowadays there's a, a whole range of plugins that come out, line producers to now have this kind of cheap, affordable uh, synths, uh, yeah. but it has cropped up and, and um, during the course of the academy that for, for tight bass lines, you need that analog sound. It's just like not going to do it. Like an sample or something, yeah? No, I mean an like a, a, analog, like, like a, an old analog synth. You can't, yeah? you can't oh, use, right, a, okay. say, a reactor or mm, one of these emulators. Well, okay, well, I'm not sure about that. I haven't got old analog synths, like natural ones, right? Yeah. I've got ones on the computer, you know, the cheap throwaway things you're talking about. Yeah. And then I've got like a emu sample, right? I tell the... The, if, I use, if I use the same sample bass note or something and put it on the EMU sampler, right, and test, and, test my, and test that on my speakers, and then I test it on my, um, you know, my Logic, my, my Logic um, computer, right, the difference is major. The EMU is miles heavier. So I do think that probably the synths are probably lacking in bass. I do, I do probably agree with that. But I haven't got a natural synth to tell you, but I've got... But like an emu is much more powerful, much more bottom end. In emu, you mean a like sampler? A, like a sampler, yeah. yeah. Okay, well, that's interesting because I would have thought it would have been no. like a, a synth, like the Korg MS-10, like we got in no. there. I mean, I, I, um, I EQ. My tannoys help me get my bass how I want to get them, do you know what I mean? Because yeah. uh, there's a lot of people mix on their little speakers and whatever, and their bass is not really heavy. But the tannoys, I can sit there and I can, I can hear properly, you know. So, so maybe to, f to get in that tight sound, it's much more down to your monitor? Monitor, yeah, I think monitors are very important. Very, very important. I mean, these ones are great. Old, you know, they're great. Older, and, and my old tannoys, are, they're working for me. They're working for me well. To be honest, before I had those, I was happy doing my thing. But when I got them, like, like, like you know, like three or four years ago when I was doing a lot of tracks and loads of bass all over the place, that's when I got my tannoys. And that's what happened. So uh, I totally think that it's on monitors. And people come round and play their tracks in my, in my monitors and they sound nice and clean and nice and thin and whatever. But and then I play my track. Then I play my track in their little monitors and it's bang, 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 you know? So monitors are very important. So what type of I've got the little gold monitors and I've got SRM 15s. Yeah. You know them ones, yeah? Okay. Oh, cool, man. They're nice, isn't it? It's exactly what you say. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know what? It, took, and it takes a little while to get used to pair of monitors, doesn't it? it? Takes a little while. I mean, at first they sounded sounded crap. Do you know what I mean? I was, what's going on here? Rubbish. You, you know, you can whack them properly, and, and they're happy. You know, just to get used to monitors. It's important. Do you have another tune to before you go? Uh, yep. What's going on here? Should I put this on? Yeah, I'll put this on. This is just done on the laptop, yeah? All oh, right. So that's interesting. What's, that. What were you using? Um, just. It's the Logic Pro, do you know what I mean? Uh -huh. uh, add, into, add into a sound cover. It's the first time I've ever done that. I've only done it twice. First time you've only made a tune on yeah. a laptop only? Just a laptop, yeah. Right, okay, cool.
Sweet as night. Nice one. So, if anyone's got any uh, questions one for one, he's not a scary man at all. <laughs>